Well, everyone, welcome to William and Mary. I'm uh, Taylor Reevely, the incumbent president. And it's absolutely grand to have you here for the Virginia Coastal Policy Center's Conference on Defending Our Coast, Ensuring Military Readiness and Economic Viability as the Waters Rise. Now that's a mouthful, but it does speak, in my view, to a crucially important matter. Whatever the metaphysics about climate change, it seems inescapably clear then at Hampton Roads, the land is subsiding and the sea is rising. And that combination poses a significant threat to anything located near the water, including major military installations. So we all need to get on the stick and figure out what to do to defend our coasts and in particular, to defend the vital military bases that grace our part of the world and are so important to the defense of the United States and the defense of our allies, particularly those in NATO. And it really looks like time is running out to begin making sustained progress on finding and implementing effective solutions. Now, William & Mary has a long-standing tradition of powerful ties to America's military forces. We've got a strong Army ROTC program that kept going when most highly selective schools abandoned theirs during the Vietnam era. William and Mary alumni have fought in all of America's conflicts from colonial times to the present. In recent years, William and Mary people have died in combat in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Somalia. Our university itself was badly hurt by the Revolutionary War, and first the British occupied us, and then our friends the French. And the Civil War, for all practical purposes, left William and Mary dead as a doornail. But miraculously, we rose from that. Our current chancellor is Robert Gates, former Secretary of Defense for two presidents, Bush and Obama. We've developed very close ties to TRADOC, and uh, we have many veterans in our student body, and we relish having veterans in our student body. And our law school leads the way for the country with its veteran clinic. In short, Long-standing ties to America's military, and we care very much about them. We also care very much about the health and welfare of Hampton Roads and of the Commonwealth of Virginia as a whole. And failure to effectively defend the coast in Hampton Roads, if it led to the forced departure of the military bases located here, would be a very severe blow to the economic and social fabric, not just of Hampton Roads, but really of all of Virginia. So to end where I began, this conference deals with crucially important issues. I look forward to the light that today's presentations and discussion will shed on how best to move forward. And now let me summon Dave Douglas, Dean Douglas of the William & Mary Law School, which is home to the Virginia Coastal Policy Center. Dave, come say a few words. Well, thank you, uh, President Reevely, and thank you all for being here today. It is our pleasure uh, at William & Mary Law School to uh, sponsor this program. Uh, I will say, uh, as many of you may know, William & Mary is the oldest law school in the United States. It was, it was founded during the middle of the American Revolution for the express purpose of training leaders. And we still have as our mission today 
the purpose of training leaders uh, for the military service or other forms of public service, and so many of our students do choose that pathway. In fact, each year at graduation, there are more graduates of our law school who become JAG officers in the, in the armed forces than any other law school in the United States. And our Veterans Benefits Program uh, is probably our signature program at the law school has had a tremendous impact nationwide. And we have taken on the goal of inspiring other law schools to create certain progr similar programs because of the great need. Another one of our great programs as well, though, at the law school is our Virginia Coastal Policy Clinic. And many of you are here today. You know about this program, uh, and that's why you're here. They're doing very important policy and legal work uh, on behalf of issues that are rising down uh, east of us um, and many of those issues that we will explore today. So it's really a great privilege for us uh, to each year sponsor this gathering. Uh, I think this year is going to be a particularly exciting program, uh, and I'm glad that you're all here today. So thank you for joining us, and thank you for the work that you do uh, in addressing these issues, because it's going to take all of us, and it's going to be a hard lift. But thank you for being here, and look forward to a wonderful day. Thank you. I have to lower the microphone for that. <laughs> Thank you very much, President Reevely and Dean Douglas, for being here and greeting you all. Thank you all for being here and to all of our wonderful speakers. I'm Elizabeth Andrews. I'm the director of the Virginia Coastal Policy Center, and we're very excited to be hosting our fifth annual conference this year, unbelievably, five years. Um, I want to start out by thanking our sponsors, Virginia Sea Grant, the Virginia Environmental Endowment, SeaLevelRise.org, VIMS, Virginia Coastal Management Program, Coastal Zone Management Program, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and the Middle Peninsula Planning District Commission. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't also say thank you because last night we aired the movie Tidewater, which is a documentary about the military and the need for resilience as waters rise. And Commander Mark Nevitt and Rear Admiral Ann Phillips and Senator Monty Mason all opened the film for us. So thank you to all of you. I believe Senator Mason is here somewhere. Raise your hand. There we go. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, and I would be also remiss if I didn't say thank you to the following people. Uh, Angela King, the Assistant Director of the Coastal Policy Center, who's actually the one with all the power today because she's the one all of you speakers will see holding up the timing cards. So everyone recognize Angela. Um, and also Colonel Paul Olson, the moderator of our first panel, and Rear Admiral Ann Phillips, the moderator of our second panel, were kind of an informal kitchen cabinet for me as we planned this, and I could not have done it without them, so thank you to both of you as well. Um, the students of the Coastal Policy Center are the reason that we thrive. So if you're a student of the VCPC, could you please raise your hand, and if we could all give them a hand, they are amazing. <laughs> They are the reason that you have a lovely program in your packet and that you have all the other documents in your packet. They're the reason that you found your way to your parking spot this morning. So thank you to all of them for all of their hard work. Um, there are some brochures and documents that might, you might find interesting out on the tables in the hallway. The restrooms are down around the corner to the left. If you missed breakfast, please go grab some. It's down in the same area down, around down the hall to the left. That's also where lunch will be. We'll have breaks throughout the day with some snacks, so you have opportunities to mix and, and mingle. And uh, then in the evening, we're gonna end the program at 4.30 with a reception sponsored by sealevelrise.org. So it should be an exciting day. Um, today is actually, this is a timely topic because uh, not only is there a lot of press about the rising sea level and the impact of flooding on our military and our coast. But Sunday is the anniversary of the landfall of Superstorm Sandy in 2012. That storm alone has damage estimated at $50 billion. And after that, we had Harvey and Irma and Maria. All you have to do is think of Houston and Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, Florida, the damage that was wrought um, to realize how timely this topic is. But in order to deal with resilience, we need to plan ahead for not just tropical storms and hurricanes. We have sea level rise, as President Reevely put it so well. We have the land sinking because of land subsidence, and we have the waters rising, and we have extreme weather, and sometimes inadequate stormwater systems to deal with it. So it takes planning ahead, 
and it takes implementation authority, and it takes funding. And that's what we're here to talk about today. The challenges that we have, what lessons have we learned? What policies are still needed? And what adaptation and collaborative solutions can be implemented? That's what we're here to talk about today. And we're going to start the day with Dr. Jane Smith. And I will note, if you look in your program, anyone who's been to Broadway, have you ever gotten that insert that says, tonight's role will be played by? <laughs> That's what we're doing. Unfortunately, Major General Jackson sends his regrets. He had to cancel after the program went to the printer because he got summoned to the White House for a briefing. To me, that's a valid reason, um, but, but barely. Um, <laughs> um, but what's interesting is not only was the core, were, not only were they delightful about it and so apologetic, but they actually ran down all of the different generals that they tried to get to take his place. And they were all in Houston or Puerto Rico or the Virgin Islands. And so it tells you yet again uh, the important role that they play, but also how our military are there around the world guarding our citizens and our interests. And so I really appreciate their efforts. But Dr. Smith saved the day and came in to be a pinch hitter. So thank you. Um, she's the Army Senior Research Scientist for Hydrodynamic Phenomenon. I did practice that a couple times. Stationed at the US Army Engineer Research and Development Center. Coastal and Hydraulics Laboratory in Vicksburg, Mississippi. She earned her PhD from the University of Delaware in civil engineering with an emphasis in coastal engineering. Her research focus is on coastal hydrodynamics, including storm surges, appropriately enough. Dr. Smith has 195 professional publications. That's pretty impressive. Including, um, she was part of the team that did a landmark report in 2014 for the DOD on the risk quantification for sustaining coastal military installation assets and mission capabilities. She's an adjunct professor at Mississippi State University, a professional engineer and coastal engineering diplomate, chair of the Coastal Engineering Research Council of the American Society of Civil Engineers, ASCE, past president of the governing board of the Coast, Oceans, Ports, and Rivers Institute of ASCE, and an ASCE Distinguished Member and Government Civil Engineer of the Year. So thank you very much for joining us. With that, Dr. Smith, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. General Jackson sends his regards, but I'm very happy to be here. Now this is a different audience than I'm used to speaking to. I'm usually talking to engineers and scientists, and I know we have some of those in the, in the audience too. But it's really exciting to come and speak to the larger community because it really will take all of us to deal with this issue. So I'm going to start out talking a little bit about what is coastal resilience from the Corps of Engineers perspective. What are some of the uh, assessments that have been going on, some of the solutions that we're working towards, and then I'll end up with some of what the future challenges are. Yeah. So this is a definition of coastal resilience that we have been using in the Corps of Engineers. We see it as, as a cycle, as a circle. So we start as a storm is approaching in the preparation and anticipation. What do we need to do to pre prepare for that storm? Then as the storm hits many of our coastal projects, we want to design them in such a way that they can withstand the storm, they can absorb the impact of it and, and withstand it well. After the storm has passed, then we want to be able to bounce back quickly, recover, come back to full function. And then in the time in between events, we want to be able to adapt our system and evolve it to be more resilient. So as you look at this, it looks like a flat circle, right? We come back to where we started every time. But unfortunately, with sea level rise, that's not the case. So this is kind of a busy plot, but it shows what I'm trying to tell. Over time, on the horizontal axis, the functionality of our system. Think of a, um, think of a coastal situation where you have a barrier island beach. So the function of that beach goes down with time. As water level comes up, we have less sand, less dune elevation to resist that storm. So if you look at that first black arrow, that's a, some kind of an event, a nor'easter in this area, an extratropical storm, or maybe a category one or two hurricane. When that hits, we see a loss of function. We go down during the storm, and then hopefully we recover and go back. We don't go all the way back to the top line, but to a line that's decreasing. But what's, what if we have a very catastrophic event? In this area, maybe a category three or four storm. Okay, so that's the blue arrow that comes down hits our coastline, again, let's say we're looking at a barrier beach. Now we have some change in equilibrium. 
we've got a breach. We have a new inlet that forms. It's a sediment sink. It's pulling sediment off our coastline. And so we don't go anywhere near the functionality we had below. We have this blue line here with some reduced function. Or similar, maybe we have a number of events happening in succession, like the red line there, with the number of events coming in that, again, bring down the functionality of our coastal system, our coastal community. So when we bring in this idea of climate change, sea level rise, we see that our systems are much more complicated than we thought of them before. We don't jump down during a storm and go back to that same level, but we come to lower levels of functionality and maybe much lower levels. What we hope is some of our projects will take us on that green dotted line where we can design them in such a way that it brings back not only the functionality we had, but maybe excess that we can use in the future. So what does a resilient coast look like? One thing you'll note here is I not only have an ocean coastline, but I also have a bay coastline. Now for a group here, that's not rocket science. You're used to that. You're used to the Chesapeake Bay being just as important as our coastal shorelines. So what do the resilient system look like? Well, what we wanted to be able to do is anticipate where the weak parts of our system are and be ready to recover afterwards. For example, if we have a beach restoration project, we might make it a little bit wider, a little bit higher dune elevation so that we can resist those storm impacts. We might stockpile sand or rubble or rock somewhere so that after a storm, we can go back and fix a breach. So being prepared for where our weak links are. A second approach that we've been using since Hurricane Katrina is this idea of multiple lines of defense. Now, for all the military folks in here, that probably makes a lot of sense. But from an engineering perspective, it's not one that we've used for a long time. So you may have a beach fill, a buried seawall, and at the same time, you may raise structures or even relocate them. These multiple lines of defense, so if you have a failure, you don't have a catastrophic failure. Think of some of the cases in Hurricane Katrina where all there was was a levee. So the levee was overtopped. There was no protection on the backside. It failed horribly, okay, catastrophically. And we want to avoid those types of failures. The third thing would be ensuring alternate networks. And we saw this a lot with Hurricane Sandy. The transportation network, the power, all the utilities, the phone service, all these things that need to function as the storm is approaching for evacuation and after the storm for recovery. We think of Puerto Rico right now. Most people still don't have power and they don't have drinking water. So there was no redundancy in these, in these systems. And then finally, we need to provide information for decision support. We need to have good information about what areas are going to flood, what the impacts are going to be, what the impacts to infrastructure would be. And so we need to be able to bring all this information together in such a way that we can make good decisions about them. Since our focus today is on military input, impacts, I tried to list here some of the military impacts that I see. So increased flood risk, that one is a pretty much a no-brainer. We understand that. So in that case, we have infrastructure that's damaged, piers, roads, buildings, utilities. In the film last night, they talked about during some of these events, they have to shut off the power on the pier in Naval Station in Norfolk. You know, all of these things come in. We don't necessarily think of our navigation channels as being infrastructure, but they are as well. We think, oh, sea level's rising. That makes the channels more useful. Well, not necessarily. It also changes how the sediment moves in the bottom, so they may fill more quickly. So there's other impacts as well. The idea of reduced usability due to things like the nuisance flooding, that was covered very well in the Tidewater movie last night. Changing risk register. So again, after the storm, with rising sea level and all the other factors that come in, the risk levels are changing. We don't go back to where we were after the storm, but we actually see that the risk is rising if we do nothing. So it's more and more important that we do something. And then, of course, life safety is number one. We see increased needs for accurate forecasting of these flood events. Um, when you're talking about um, ships having to leave the harbor area for safety to go out to sea, you want to make those decisions based on the best information that you can possibly have. Also things like evacuation routes, how you can quickly recover. All these require good information about what's going to happen. And there will also be increased requirements for the military to react to humanitarian disaster relief. 
We see that already as there are storms, hurricanes, typhoons, other flooding events all over the world. We come in and help, and we need to be prepared to do that. We also see a rising importance in the Pacific theater and the Arctic theater. In the Pacific, where we have these islands where our, they're experiencing sea level rise, they have nowhere to retreat to. Um, all of a sudden, our air bases are located on the coastline. So it's very important in those areas, but also in the Arctic. Now, the Arctic problem is a little bit different. Now we have open water, new navigation routes opening up, but also have increased issues of coastal erosion. A lot of those areas in the Arctic are shorefast ice at the time we have the most intense storms. That may not be the case anymore. As the ice sheet um, becomes smaller, um, grows out at different times of the year, we have a lot more exposure to these big storm events. So those, par those areas are very important as well. Okay, so I'd like to talk about some of our projects where we're talking about climate change impacts. And this is one that I think some of you know quite well. This is the work that we did at Naval Station in Norfolk in a project, I think it's been about five years ago now. So what we wanted to do is try to assess the vulnerability of the base and its assets. So a number of different parts to the study. The first part was looking at the um, storm surge and the waves, the sediment movement that would happen in these types of storms. So we ran a number of storms at different sea levels, half a meter up to two meters of sea level to look at what the impacts would be. We developed fragility curves so that we know how these flood conditions impact infrastructure and at what point they'll fail or lose usability. We did a decomposition of the missions and the infrastructure that was available up on the upper left there, how they're connected, what are all these assets and how do they function in flood conditions. And then we did a risk analysis using a Bayesian network approach where we looked at different storm conditions and with that we could look at through a life cycle what would happen to the assets, how usable it would it be. And the idea is to look at tipping points or thresholds um, where suddenly we see a lot of problems, um, a lot of issues, and try to identify what those are. So as we approach those levels of sea level rise, um, what, what should be our actions to accommodate those? And then finally, you have to communicate that information. So how do you communicate that, not only to the community, but to the military in general? Because uh, particularly the Navy has a lot of assets right on the ocean, but so does the Army. And in fact, the Air Force, too, is, is well impacted, obviously, the Coast Guard, too. Another example of a project was following Hurricane Sandy. We did a project called the North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study, where we were looking at the coastal risk all the way from the southern coast of Virginia to the northern coast of Maine. We ran over 1,000 synthetic hurricanes, tropical storms, plus 100 extra tropical, the winter storms that we see using historical information. We looked at what's possible, what could hit our coast. We did this with a combined group of models shown by all those connected circles and squares in the middle. We had uh, meteorological models, wave models, storm surge models, and they all work together. They're all part of the same problem. So as we model those processes, we look at the flood levels, and we could come up with um, an analysis of what the hazard is along the coast. How often do we expect to have flood levels to a certain level? Now this project was really quite important in terms of providing this information readily um, for any projects in this area. We've archived this information in a web page called the Coastal Hazard System. So now every time we want to do a study, we don't have to go back and redo all this complex modeling. It's already done. If you have a project in this North, uh, North Atlantic area, you can tap that database and pull out all the driving information to um, provide the um, the driving forces for designing your projects and looking at what the impacts of those projects would be. So that's actually quite revolutionary for the core. We'd like to now extend this work to the South Atlantic. We've been trying to do that for the last couple of years, and this usually happens, right? When do we get the storms and where do we get them? Okay, we get them before we do the study, right? And so now we're really pushing before we get the next study to do the South Atlantic coast, to do um, Puerto Rico, Virgin Island, and then move to the Gulf of Mexico coast. Another project that we've got ongoing, this one is just starting, it's called Total Watershed Decision Support. This is an effort within um, our uh, 
uh, Urdic community, the Corps of Engineers community, to bring together not only the hydrodynamic codes on the coast, but the inland models as well. So we can look at flooding situations similar to what we saw on Harvey, where you're not only affected by the coastal storm surge, but also the rainfall and the runoff within. So this is a demo that we did for um, Incheon in South Korea. So on the left here, we have all the hydrodynamic information where we were modeling a typhoon hitting the coast, as well as the inland flooding from monsoon rains. And then we bring in all the social, uh, economic, cultural data as well. We can visualize this in the middle, look where the highest storm surge is, look where the military bases are, look where the population centers are, and then we can build that into a decision support system. So we can weight these different factors and come up with a red, yellow, green system that tells us where are we going to expect the problems. And this has ap 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 <laughs> it's applicable <laughs> inland and on the coast. So if you have a flood event in Afghanistan, how will that affect um, the local population in terms of agriculture, or the NGOs that are working there, you can pull all that information together, or flooding on the Mississippi River. So coming out also from the North Atlantic study, we started looking at more of natural and nature-based features, that we really need to be looking at this broad range of solutions. If we go from the coastline, we might be looking at breakwaters and groins, beach fills. In the bays, we might be looking at living shorelines using vegetated features. Uh, levees, relocation, we need to look at the full range of options, not just putting a concrete in the ground. And so there's been this renewed focus on natural and nature-based features, also non-structural options. There's places that we, we probably should be moving back as opposed to building walls. We need to look at not only the short-term but the long-term evolution and how these interact. So in natural and nature-based features, we kind of break them down into four different areas. One's dunes and beaches. This is one that you guys know well, right? We've done a lot of beach fill projects. We widened the dune, or widened the beach, raised the dune. We saw a lot of benefits in the areas in New Jersey where these projects had been built when Hurricane Sandy came and hit. Let much less damage. We're also doing a lot of work looking at vegetated features building vegetated islands within wetlands to help them regenerate, break up that long fetch where big waves come in. So that's an area where there's some ongoing research. Oyster and coral reefs, again, that's an area that's been used a lot in Chesapeake Bay in terms of the oyster reefs. And then barrier islands, and you've done barrier island work on this uh, mid-Atlantic coast. There's a lot of restoration work going on in the Louisiana, Mississippi coastal areas. These are areas that have been very active. The maritime forest, we as the Corps of Engineers have not done a lot of work in this area, but we see examples of this, of vegetation strips that have been built in Japan to protect against tsunamis. Uh, we saw them being very effective in the 2004 tsunami in Indonesia, areas that were fronted with these maritime forests survived much better. So these are all ways that we can use what has worked in nature with some engineering um, to, to build much more resilient coasts. These are features that don't just fail and stop, but that can grow and evolve with changing sea level. Okay, what, one more example of how the Corps of Engineers incorporates sea level rise considerations in some of our projects. So here's the three curves that we typically see. The Corps of Engineers looks at all of these scenarios as we go. The first curve includes subsidence, but also looks at just the historical rate of sea level rise. And then we have a, mid, a middle level and a high level of sea level rise. Now we can't always afford to build or design to these high levels of sea level rise, but we want to look at what the impacts are. So there's a feasibility study that was recently done on the southern shore of Stanton Island in our New York district that looked at these different scenarios. And as they came up with their solutions, which are shown, I'm afraid it's a, sort of a small box there, but it's a uh, earthen levee covered with sand, a rock seawall covered with sand, and a vertical seawall. So we can't afford to build these to the high level of sea level rise, but what we can do is build the foundations for these structures in such a way that we can add elevation to them without a lot more cost. We don't have to tear it down and rebuild it. So by doing that, building better foundations so we can add maybe a parapet wall to the um, rock structure or increase the elevation of the <clears throat> seawall, it only ra raised the cost of this project by about 5%. So by doing that preparation ahead of time, 
On a decadal level, we can go back and modify these structures, and that's the way that we'd like to see adaptability on these decadal scales. Okay, so my last slide here is to talk about some of the challenges as I see them. So what I just talked about is sometimes we can't justify the investment in these high levels of protection. Okay, things like adjacent property, buying the property so that we can widen the base of a levee, okay, or build them higher. Or even buying property to let the coastline evolve or the, the wetland evolve shoreward. So that's, that's a challenge. We also need to, we know that designing for this range of sea level rise, you know, between half a meter and two meters is a big difference. But that's not the only thing. Sea level rise, we kind of have a handle on, we've got bounds on those, but we know less about how the storms themselves will change, how will the tracks change, the intensities. We think maybe hurricanes will be less frequent but more intense when we get them. We don't build that into our designs now, so that's a huge, huge um, challenge for us. Environmental consideration, will our wetlands be able to keep up with sea level rise? How will the human use of the coast change? And also funding. For any of you that are federal, you realize how challenging it is when you start the year and you don't know what your funding level is going to be. If you're in the middle of building a project, how do you plan for that construction if you don't know what your funding is going to be? And then as a scientist and an engineer, I want to end up with just some of our future research needs on a scientific area. We don't know a whole lot about the robustness of these systems, these natural nature-based systems. We know that wetlands will change in characteristic through the season, but also in time. If they're hit by a major hurricane, will they be able to recover? So these are the th things we need to look at. Also, how do this gray and green infrastructure interact? If we have a seawall with the wetland in front of it, how will those two features interact? Um, and then how do we couple the modeling of the physical processes, the waves and water levels, with the ecological processes. Right now, they're modeled in a much cruder way, so we need to bring the modeling of those together. And then we need to focus on quantifying the full range of benefits, not just the economic benefits, but the social, the ecosystem, and, 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 all the other things. So we're doing a lot, things are moving forward, but there's a long ways to go. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Smith? We have um, some microphones if anyone has a question. In the meantime, maybe if Colonel Olson wants to come up with his panel. Je Amber, Jeff over here has one, I think. Or thank you. Uh, doctor, thank you. That was a great presentation. It, about three quarters of the way through, you showed a kind of a hierarchy of you said we need to look at the full breadth of options, and you showed oyster reefs and seawalls and other natural-based systems. But as somebody who is trained in oceanographic sciences, you know, the last place we should build is on a barrier island. We, we all know that, you know, active dynamic systems, but we build there anyways. So at what point in your hierarchy, what, what is the trigger for the core to say, you know what, we could do this, we could do this, we could do these four things together, but it's really time to just relocate the pullback and relocate the infrastructure. So what, what is the trigger point where you decide we can't pursue these protective measures, it's time to relocate? Well, right now it's all focused on economics. So it's, uh, the economics is the threshold of whether it makes sense or not. So after Hurricane Katrina, areas in the coast of Mississippi, we did do a lot of buyouts, um, in that, that approach of relocation, but we haven't done it in a lot of other places. It's oftentimes a very hard sell. Uh, after Hurricane Katrina, the, the mayor of New Orleans brought in a think tank. They came up with all these ideas of we shouldn't be building in these low areas, blah, blah, blah. First public meeting, somebody says, that's where I live. I want to build back. And they said, okay. <laughs> you know, I, that's, that's part of the problem. So it's our decisions are made economically, but in the end, the decisions tend to be political. So we need policies that help us do that. Good question. Baker. Was there another question over here, Amber? You started walking that way, so I didn't know. Okay, thank you very much. All right. <laughs>